you for coming, everyone. Um, we are pleased to present this event. Obviously, there's been a huge addition of people who are interested in this topic after the controversy last night with Google, the Federalist, and Zero Hedge. We'll hit that a bit, but I'm excited to have a broader conversation about platforms and their responsibility, especially when it comes to um, content, um, especially the more controversial sorts. Um, so we've got a really good group with us here. Um, we have okay. Renee DiResta, who is the Technical Research Manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. We have Klon Kitchens, who's a visiting fellow at NSI and the Director of the Center for Technology Policy at the Heritage Foundation. We have Rick Lane, who's the CEO of Iggy Ventures. And finally, we have Carl Svavo, who is the Vice President and General Counsel of NetChoice. So um, if you want to say a quick uh, word. About yeah, thanks so much, Marshall. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, and NSI is delighted to be co-hosting this event with the Lincoln Network. Um, just a quick word about what NSI is, for those that don't know. Uh, we are a national security policy institute uh, that sits at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. We are keenly focused on um, practical solutions to national security problems. And we are made up of a network of about 150 fellows, which you mentioned Klon Kitchen is one of our fellows. We're delighted to have him uh, in the fold. And the fellows come from, uh, they either have a former government service or their industry, uh, they have industry experience and, and they are practitioners in the field. So uh, we have some academics, but we are by and large practitioners uh, and we bring that practical, pragmatic experience uh, to thinking about policy solutions for national security issues. And that's why this conversation is important to us. Um, NSI has two major focus areas for 2020. Uh, one is China, but the second is uh, emerging technology and thinking about how technology uh, influences and shapes our approach to national security problems. And so uh, we're absolutely delighted to be partnering with the network, uh, the Lincoln Network on today's program, uh, and we're looking forward to the discussion. So thanks again, and Marshall, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Matthew. So yeah, so uh, I'm Marshall Kozloff, the Director of Outreach and Media at the Lincoln Network, and I think before we move into sort of the broader themes uh, that Matthew sort of hinted at, I think it'd be important to sort of set the stage here um, and reference how what happened last night with Google, Zero Hedge, the Federalist, how that does or doesn't relate to this conversation that we're having today. Um, so maybe, Klon, if you could sort of start us off with that, that'd be very helpful. Uh, sure, I'll do what I can. <clears throat> uh, so there was some breaking news um, late, actually two nights ago, uh, that uh, Google was engaging uh, two particular uh, platforms, Zero Hedge and The Federalist. And um, while they're related, they were actually slightly different. With, with Zero Hedge, they had been warned previously by Google about um, the way they were handling uh, some of the comments and content on um, their web page and how that related to ad space. And um, Google had made the determination that they had not adequately addressed that. And so they were going to be demonetizing them, which just simply means uh, not running uh, Google Ads uh, on on their website. Uh, the Federalist uh, was slightly different. Uh, they were um, informed first, unfortunately, by NBC, but then ultimately by Google, that um, the way their their web page was set up, specifically um, that their comment sections was allowing uh, ads to be run next to those comments, which is typically not the way Google Ads works. Uh, because if you're a toothpaste provider, uh, we all know the comment section is typically a cesspool. And uh, if you're Colgate, you would prefer your toothpaste not be next to whatever awful diatribe happens to be in the comment section. Um, eventually, Google and Federalist had a conversation. Uh, the Federalist made an adjustment, and it, it would appear that all things are, are now right. The biggest concern about this is that it wasn't just this kind of curious marketing uh, conversation that was happening, but all of this was set off by a, uh, a research group in the UK that clearly has an agenda. They had partnered with NBC. NBC made some of this known to Google, and then that's when action started taking place. And so 
it all just plays into the ongoing concerns about trust, both in terms of mass media and also tech. And uh, it would seem that the majority of the community's interpretation of all these events will fit right in with where they were before they happened. Yeah, so um, to open this up to the group, I think the key phrase that Klon added at the end was this all relates to trust. And I think part of the issue here when we're debating what responsibility platforms have with this content is how can they navigate that responsibility when there's a lack of trust, especially in a hyper-partisan context? So whoever wants to jump in for that, that'd be, I think that'd be very helpful. Yeah, if I could jump in. With respect to what happened with the Federalist, uh, I mean, that seemed to be a, a mountain out of a molehill at the end of the day. You and, and Klein, you explained it really well. Advertisers at the end of the day don't want their advertisements next to controversial content. And the Federalists had a contract with Google that they would not put ads next to the comment section. Google was notified. Now, the manner in which they were notified, you know, that, that's interesting. But at the end of the day, Federalist was in violation of their contract with Google Ads. Google provided them notice to kind of clean up their act before they could have ads. Uh, uh, so they gave them three days to continue and clean up their act. And the Federalist Society said, oh, okay, and, and they're working to do it. So this was kind of like a watchdog group reporting activity. Now that watchdog group apparently had an agenda, but that's what happened. I think the reason that it got blown out of proportion uh, and, and sorry, I, I meant the, the Federalist, not Federalist Society. Um, uh, the reason this got blown out of proportion in part is because NBC News kind of rushed to report it. And the, the report was inaccurate. They've since issued a correction. But unfortunately, that's kind of the way that things tend to snowball. Now, getting to the issue of trust, what you saw last night was exactly on the issue of trust. It was a fair application of the rules. The uh, Google ads will do this, whether you are the Federalist or somebody on the left or in the middle. If you violate their terms, it happened to Tector even. And um, you know, if, if you're violating their terms, they're gonna apply their terms equally. Uh, what I raise concern with and what causes a breach of trust is when certain groups try to ask for special treatment. And that's kind of what you're seeing kind of in the media right now is certain groups asking Google to treat them differently because they happen to engage in political content. And if it happened to somebody on the left or maybe just a website talking about dogs, it should be applied equally. And so that's how you maintain the trust. You apply rules equally. And that's what you saw with respect to the Federalists just the other evening. So Marshall, if I can just, one of the, one of the realities to all of this, quite independently of, frankly, you know, facts one way or the other, is Gallup has shown on multiple polls that distrust and a lack of um, a lack of trust in the tech community, and particularly a belief that the tech community um, adjusts its provision of services based on p their political leanings, that's held by over seventy percent of polled Americans. And so the, the reality is, is that industry has a very big perception problem and that that's not going away. And it's something that has to be dealt with and it can't just be, the answer can't always be, no, 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 you don't get it. And so that's what policy people like us are struggling with as we try to navigate those waters. Yeah, one of the challenges there is that that's actually kind of the point, right? The reason that perception is, exists is because of a concerted effort uh, to work the refs in, in many cases. And I think that, we can't separate those two things either. Uh, you don't get to a point where 70% of people believe that, particularly about an obscure internet law, particularly over a period of three years, two years, uh, without the kind of concerted, repetitive beat the drum and fundraise on the idea that, uh, that big tech is censoring rank and file conservatives, uh, particularly on Twitter, but on Facebook as well. Um, so I think that it's, it's not solely at this point a problem of tech industry communication. Uh, it's also a problem of a concerted uh, campaign to make people hold that belief. I also think there's a, another underlying issue that has to be discussed, which is the power of the, the, the major players in Silicon Valley to basically demonetize. Um, it sounds, oh, they just demonetize them. But if, if revenue is your livelihood and they're able to cut you off at their will, 
that raises some questions when there's no other place to go. If you look at search or if you look at the underlying advertising market, there are really three big players, Amazon, Facebook, and Google and their respective silos, but they are the, the biggest players. And, and that's a question that's to be looked at. But again, I, I agree with Carl on the point that these are free enterprise and it gets into and they're private sector entities. Um, and at the end of the day, they should be able to do what they want. Um, the question is, is if they're doing what they want, are they now publishers? And do they qualify for 230 protection? And that gets into sort of the heart of the debate that we're gonna have today, is when does that line cross? And again, I'm a, you know, I always use the analogy that a theater, a motion picture theater, does not have to show adult entertainment in it. That they can just show G movies or PG-13 movies, that's up to them. Um, but the question is, are there certain times when entities become publishers on, online that are making editorial decisions and monetization is a key editorial decision because you can cut somebody off at the knees if you basically take away their revenue. Yeah, so I mean, Rick raised the question of, do you become a, pu uh, a publisher if you engage in content moderation. And the entire purpose behind Section 230 is the answer is no, right? That, that's why the law was created. And what you're seeing oftentimes is people trying to put words into the mouths of the, the creators of the law. Well, they didn't really mean this when they wrote it or the internet was, was different. They couldn't have envisioned Google or Facebook. And one of the things that I'm fortunate of is one of those authors sits on the board of NetChoice, Representative Chris Cox. So I've actually gone to him and asked, what do you think about, about Section 230, the way it's being applied and some of the stuff. And what you found is it's being applied pretty much the way that he and Senator Wyden envisioned. And the, what they did was they said, look, we want platforms to engage in content moderation, period. They called it the Good Samaritan Law, right? So the Good Samaritan Law is based on the premise of you're walking down the street and you see somebody struggling to breathe and you start performing CPR. This is a classic example. And as you're performing CPR, you accidentally break their ribs. And we as a society decided that we don't want to allow that to create a lawsuit. We don't want somebody whose ribs are broken because you tried to do the right thing sue you. We want to encourage people to do the right thing. And that's what Section 230 does. Section 230C1 says that a platform is not liable. And what it basically did was it took 60 years of court-created doctrine, uh, which stemmed all the way back to the 1950s, saying if you're the intermediary, you're not liable. It's called conduit immunity. And it's been used by booksellers. It's been used by newspapers. It's used by many different groups to avoid liability. So what section C1 did of section 230 said, we're gonna enshrine that part of the law. We're gonna make crystal clear that if you're just a platform, you're not liable. Then the really novel component is section C2, which is the Good Samaritan component, where the authors at the time, Representative Ron Wyden, now Senator Wyden, and Representative Chris Cox sat down and said, look, we want platforms to moderate and we want to encourage them to do so. So they've gone through and they've given platforms broad discretion to make those moderating decisions because we don't want them to be questioned on every time they decide to leave content up or take content down. And that's been applied pretty broadly. In DC, we have the tendency to only look at it through the very, very, very narrow lens of politics. But the way that Section 230 has been applied goes well beyond politics. Uh, one of the classic examples that comes up from a colleague of mine over at Reddit is there is a subreddit about dogs standing on hind legs. And if you try to post a picture on the subreddit of a dog on all fours, they will delete it. That is neither lewd nor lascivious nor uh, harassing, but that's otherwise objectionable content in the eyes of somebody who only wants to see dogs standing on their hind legs. So we've given a lot of power to the platforms to be moderators because we want them to be moderators. They remove hate speech, they remove terrorist speech. They have platforms that have created a vacuum of no political speech. They have speech only for conservatives, speech only for liberals, they have speech only for dogs. So this is the type of power that we want to have happen. And it's been made clear that they are not the publisher 
And the insinuation that they become the publisher simply because they engage in this will have deleterious consequences on our online experience. And as Klein mentioned, the comment section is oftentimes a cesspool. Fortunately, that's limited because without Section 230, much more of the internet becomes a cesspool. So Carl, Carl is right um, in terms of the safe harbor provisions. Um, and, I, and there are obviously benefits to that. And he talks about 60 years of law before Section 230. And maybe if we didn't have Section 230, maybe if we had studied it before it was actually enacted, we would have known that probably case law may have been much more helpful um, to all sides than Section 230, but we didn't. So we're stuck with what was put in place in 1996. But one of the other authors of Section 230 that isn't really mentioned is Jerry Berman. Jerry Berman um, was the founder of CDT and was one of the individuals who was really the outside influencer on almost all tech policy. I call him the father of technology policy. And this is what he wrote in, in, in 2018. And it's much longer, but what he said here is, we need to debate, rethink, and reform the statute we helped write. The civil liberties groups like CDT and EFF are all in defending garbage and dangerous. Sites like Backpage, um, enough sex ads, enough is enough. And then he goes on to talk about how we need to relook at 230 because it is not being implemented in the way that those of us who worked on 96 Telecom back like myself or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or on the privacy self-regulatory world that we all worked on, what happened and is that the companies that came after us decided to, instead of using Section 230 to do the benefits that they need to do, are now, I keep, sorry, my phone keeps going off, um, are now using it as a shield. Even Ron Wyden has said it's getting harder and harder for him to defend because the way Section 230 is being abused. So the question isn't, are there benefits to 230? The real question that we are asking, the DOJ is asking, that Nancy Pelosi is asking, that Vice President Biden is asking, and the President of the United States are all asking, is, is it time to reform 230 to get the balance back? Because right now, there is no economic incentive for social networking sites to be proactive to take the steps that are necessary. They get a safe harbor if they do it, but they don't have a proactive responsibility to go to the next level. And I can take, you know, from my own personal experience as being the point person at MySpace on all these policy issues, when we were the very first social networking site, I can tell you the conversations we had internally about what we should and should not do. And the lawyers would say, we don't have to do this because of 230, but we said, we're going to do it because it was the right thing to do. And we made business decisions that may have put us at a disadvantage and allow Facebook to move fast and break things and beat us in the marketplace. But we felt it was our moral responsibility to ensure that the products and services that we were rolling out, the functionality was not used in a way that could harm our users, especially our younger users. So that's a good pivot to the topic of responsibility. Um, and what it is. So I think will be very helpful and I'd love to get everyone's thoughts on this is, what are the problems that y'all see from a content moderation? So like what is content that isn't getting moderated right now, especially in the national security context that you think platforms aren't policing the way they should be? This could relate to the election, this could relate to sort of that, the, the debate about ISIS videos on Twitter five years ago. Where do we sort of see the breakdown of following through on those issues? Maybe uh, start on that front. I feel like that's something I look at. Stanford Internet Observatory, we look specifically at um, manipulation on the internet. That's basically what we study. Alex teaches a class on trust and safety that goes through a whole litany of harms, everything ranging from uh, CSAM material to uh, harassment to Russian interference, right? And so uh, my own work is mostly on state actors, manipulation campaigns, and conspiracies. Um, one of the things that we see is over the last four years, I would say, since maybe mid-2017, mid late 2016, uh, you started to see a little bit more willingness to address malign content on the internet, to recognize that there were downstream harms um, to particular types of content. And that if we thought about moderation more from a mitigation of harms perspective or a duty of care perspective, as opposed to a topic-based content moderation perspective, uh, we could potentially find ways to rethink um, 
frameworks that were kind of a, a content neutral approach, but recognized that there were certain behavioral characteristics that were manipulative, certain dissemination patterns, botnets to, you know, to game algorithms to amplify content, these sorts of things, uh, fake accounts, mass proliferation of fake accounts. There was a lot of uh, rethinking in, in conjunction with civil society, academia, government was involved, you know, senators were participating in the conversations too, uh, which led to the remove, reduce, and form policies uh, that Facebook and others have today, which says that they can either take content down, which is the remove, or they can downrank it, deprecate it, demonetize it, that's reduce, and then there's the uh, inform, which is put up the interstitial and do the fact check, right? So most of those policies were put in place uh, in large response because of public opinion. So there is no regulatory requirement uh, to do any of those things. So what we've seen over the last few years is there are now integrity teams that are responsible for looking at things like foreign interference, um, which is a national security issue. Uh, there are more robust um, kind of tech consortiums like uh, Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, um, things like sharing hashes of terrorist videos and you know, uniformly taking them down. Uh, most of those things though have come about as self-regulatory measures. So there's no obligation uh, for the platforms to continue to undertake them. And that's the part uh, that I think makes those who are more inclined uh, to want more moderation of those issues a little bit wary. There's nothing that requires them to do it. Right now, it's more just in response to bad public opinion. They, they chose to do it. And, and you know, yeah. Renee brings up a really good point. Uh, you know, is insinuate there's no economic reason to do any content moderation, but Renee's exactly right. There is a big economic reason for all these platforms to moderate content, remove offensive content, engage in national security protection, because at the end of the day, if people don't like their companies and their services, people won't use them. If I think that going onto a platform is a giant cesspool of trash, stuff I don't want to see, I'm not going to go there. So there is the financial incentive by these platforms to engage in the content moderation, in the national security standards, in making sure that their sites are safe, that their sites are secure, and protecting their users from doing it. Now, uh, I meant to mention, I do want to thank NSI uh, for, for having me here. Uh, I, I'm, a adjunct professor actually at uh, George Mason Law School. And one of the things that I try to impress on my students is the importance of Section 230 at the beginning. Because it's very easy, and remember, under existing law, if platforms did absolutely nothing, if they went in the direction of allowing all sorts of election interference on their platform, if they wanted to allow every piece of content ever posted to remain on their site, they would assume no liability. They would assume no liability if they did absolutely nothing. And it is because of Section 230 that they can remove this offensive content. And so if we want to protect our elections, if we want to protect the security of our country, then we need to empower platforms a wide breadth of power to remove content that they consider to be lewd, lascivious, and otherwise objectionable. Because it's in that last category that you can see hate speech, terrorist speech, or election interference lie. So you saw a proposal uh, coming out recently from the Department of Justice, as reported by the Wall Street Journal, that they want to remove the otherwise objectionable part of Section 230. And if you do that, then platforms are not only disincentivize, they're liable if they remove election interference content, for example. So Carl, Carl brought up two. So that that's are, that's uh, one of oh, the sorry. one of the one of the real problems that we're seeing is seeing a lot of people try to pull the threads of Section 230, and if you do, the whole quilt will unravel and will end up with more 8chan than than uh, safe spaces online. So Carl brought up two points that I think are interesting and are in conflict. So one, he talked about the safe harbor and he always falls back on the safe harbor, which is great because I agree with them on that. I think the safe harbor does allow, but he said something very important. He said, if the social network sites decided to do nothing, absolutely nothing, they would be scot-free 
And that's because of the protections of Section 230, because you can't sue them. You can't go after them at the state or local level. That's exactly what we face in Backpage.com at the state and local level, which was the state AGs and the survivor groups were not able to do anything to go against Backpage because they weren't doing anything. They were actually helping facilitate, we found out later, the ads that were targeting and, and selling young girls and boys. But, the, but he's right, and that's where, where the rubber meets the road. It's not the safe harbor parts that Carl keeps talking about. It's that they actually have no incentive to do anything. And the subreddits are very interesting. He talked about cats and dogs. You know, but the subreddits are moderated by volunteers. So if I create a subreddit that is doing horrible things, and I'm the moderator, I can let it do horrible things, and Reddit can make advertising dollars off of that subreddit, and they're not violating any laws. And so that's, and they can't be sued. And that's the, that's where the rubber meets the road on this whole section 230. It's not the safe harbor. That's a red herring in my view. And I'll, I'll work with Carl and Net Choice and others to protect that safe harbor. The question is creating the incentives that Carl just said don't exist for them to do anything if they don't want to. And that's where I and my groups I work with um, are looking to make changes to and the justice so, Marshall, Marshall, just to correct the, the legal history on something, because uh, one of the things that I do at my, in my law school class, and uh, for those interested uh, who, from GMU Law, it's uh, Law 497, Emerging Internet uh, Law. I start with the history of Section 230. And when you look at the history of Section 230, you actually had a case. It was Prodigy. And, and Prodigy was a bulletin board, <laughs> and they got sued for libelous content posted by somebody else. But right. because Prodigy, or sorry, CompuServe, because CompuServe engaged in absolutely no content moderation, absolutely no content moderation, they were protected. So, and then you had a couple years later, Prodigy comes along and they say, we wanna remove bad content, we wanna make it family friendly. And because they were engaging in the removal of bad content, Prodigy was liable. So CompuServe, no moderation. And remember, this is before the creation of Section 230. CompuServe, no moderation, no liability. Prodigy, you try to do the right thing, you assume total liability. So once again, as I said earlier, if platforms do absolutely nothing, absolutely no moderation, existing court laws dating back decades say, if you do nothing, you are not liable. If you do something, you become liable. And that's where the Good Samaritan, the real brilliance of Section 230 came through. And as we try to remove the incentive for businesses and platforms to remove objectionable content, we are disincentivizing them from engaging in the content moderation we want and encouraging them to move into a do nothing system. One of the things I like to remind people of, annihilation of Section 230 or moderate amendment of Section 230 or limiting Section 230, the services most helped by that are services like 8chan and 4chan, the ones that say we're not going to engage in content moderation. The ones most harmed are the ones trying to create decent spaces on the internet. So if we want to solve all the problems that have been identified, we need a robust and strong incentive for platforms to engage in content moderation like we have in Section 230. Right. In, this, in the safe harbor provision, again, you keep forgetting we still have the CompuServe problem, which is sites doing nothing. And that's the part that we're focused on. So we can stop talking about the safe harbor. We're in, at least I'm in agreement with you on that. But what are we doing to Renee, what she had talked about, was, which is the duty of care. Those types of ideas that are out there of how do we move forward to create the incentive? The Earned Act is another perfect example of, do we create a framework where there are economic incentives? And I wanna get back to the economic incentive issue, which is very important. Carl talks about people will leave the site, but if there, that's easily said, easier said than done, as we all know um, about the network effects. But having even said that, if, the, if you're looking at an economic incentive and you're sitting down with your business people, and I've done this, I don't know if Carl's ever been in the private sector and worked in exactly this conversation with your lawyers and your business development team. But they say, we want to do this and we can make our site sticky. It's going to be a killer app. It's going to be a killer functionality. And the lawyers are telling us, you know what? You have 230 liability protection. So if it harms anybody, we don't have to do anything. And we're going to make a ton of money if we do this. 
it takes moral authority to say, no, we're not going to do that no matter what, because we, just because we have Section 230 liability protection, we're not going to do this. But so the economic incentive within the business itself is to make money. That's what their obligations are to their stockholders. But if they are trying to make sure that they're making their site safe, and there's no liability where you could be sued for it, like manufacturing a car that has, you know, the Ford out there, you know, the old Ford Pinto, then you have the economic incentive is to do what you can do unless you have the moral authority. And that's sort of the business reality that we're in. So what we're trying to do in our groups is to say, look at, we agree with the safe harbors. We agree we want moderation. But at the same time, we need to create the economic and legal incentives Make sure that they're not building four Pintos and rolling them out in the streets that our kids are driving. So here's a question, though, um, for you um, on that, Rick. What's the Ford Pinto of the Internet today? Right. So because you're suggesting that you're, if, if, that, if, if that's not happening right now, what is the Ford Pinto? Well, I think you saw the recent filing in uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, by a group of entities, a whistleblower um, complaint at the SEC, which highlights a whole litany of Ford Pinto-like situations that are on Facebook. And so you do see that, and um, you should read the great Washington Post story on it. I'm happy to get you the SEC filings, but it goes into great details of what was done within Facebook. And again, I know it was happening on Facebook because in the early days, I had conversations with them about cleaning up their site, saying that this is the steps that we're taking. Why don't you join us? And they just said, no, we're just gonna move fast and break things. So there's a long history of Facebook not taking these types of issues seriously and i know from personal experience yeah you know i I can't i can't speak to rick's personal experience but i've only seen the exact opposite from uh, our members in particular and and many of the other good actors out there i mean they take seriously their obligation to make their sites appealing and safe for users we compiled just six months worth of data where facebook youtube and twitter alone took down 5 billion pieces of uh, posts or accounts because of things like child pornography, spam, hate speech, terrorist content. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing this. I think Renee explained their, the rename, uh, redefine and uh, inform, or sorry, uh, uh, reframe, remove and, and inform uh, standards that they engage in. Yeah. And, and so the, the reality is these platforms all know that their fates are tied to the user experience and no one wants to be the next MySpace. They want to make sure that their customers and their users want to come up and, and join us. And one of the things that I've realized, unfortunately, in, in all my years doing this is that there's really a complete misunderstanding of Section 230. And that happens whether you're an attorney or you are somebody in the media or you essentially just want to work the refs. And I actually have on my background a correction from the New York Times article. And this was front page B1. Uh, It was called The Law That Allows Hate Speech on the Internet, Section 230. This was from August 6th. And that, that was the headlines. Very big, very big. And their correction was, an earlier version of this article incorrectly described the law that protects hate speech on the internet. The First Amendment, not Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, protects it. So there's clearly a lot of misunderstanding about what Section 230 does. And at the end of the day, if we want more civility, more good content on the internet, and less bad stuff, we need to we need to protect Section 230. If we want to achieve all the goals, then we need to do that. So I, I think a good um, polling question for the group to sort of see where we move forward on it is, and I'll ask this to each of you, obviously we'll just go down the line, but um, do we need to reform Section 230? Yes or no? Just sort of yes or no answer for the audience. If so, what should be put in place and if not, what, sh- what, um, why should we be confident that we can continue on in the status quo? Um, so I, I think we start a few fun. It's very much an open question for me. Um, I look, you know, the people on, on this video, we spend a lot of time thinking about this. 
And, uh, you know, even this conversation has been divided between the safe harbor aspect and the good acting, right? I mean, like it's, <clears throat> I, I understand your desire as moderator to kind of get to a yes or no. It's, it's good <laughs> and wise of you to do that. Um, but uh, but I, I, it's, and we're not even talking about the national security context of all this, right? I mean, the domestic policy side of this is complex enough, but then we add in uh, foreign inauthentic activity that affects political outcomes, that then provokes the desire in some political arenas to exact their pound of flesh by removing section 230. Like it's not a virtuous circle, it's an evil one. And that's what we're trying to navigate. So that's a very long answer of saying, eh, it depends. Nuance is good, so <laughs> no worries. But I welcome an unnuanced answer from any of you guys. <laughs> so uh, Marshall, I, I actually do think we should amend section 230 and that amendment should be the removal of the language that was added under FOSTA-SESTA. Uh, that, that was some language that has had significant unintended consequences. In fact, several lawmakers uh, introduced legislation to look at the unintended consequences of the first and only amendment of Section 230. And that was actually opposed by a number of the advocates for that bill and for that amendment. And what we have seen is we've actually seen a rise in crime and a rise in abuse as a result of the only amendment of Section 230. And what I'd like to do is do a further deeper dive study on the unintended consequences of that. And if it shows that there have been unintended harms, as I suspect there will, then we need to amend Section 230 to remove the first and only amendment because clearly it's shown that when you try to pull on the thread of Section 230, you start unraveling the entire sweater. So if you're asking, should we consider amending 230? The answer is yes, and it should be to remove the FOSTA-SESTA amendment. So I think now is a good time, unless, everyone, unless anyone has anything else to add. Um, I was just gonna say, obviously I think it should be amended. Um, I think there is a need, and FOSTA-SESTA is a perfect example of a, a great amendment that is saving countless lives and abuse of, of children. Um, and so, and there was 150 anti-human trafficking groups um, and survivor groups that supported that legislation, the leading groups that are out there, including the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NICMIC, who was probably the strongest supporter of that legislation. So I always find it interesting when somebody from representing Google and Facebook, like that choice is saying that all these harms that are being caused um, when their ultimate goal is to try to stop any legislation to amend Section 230. But there are no actual studies that show that there has been harm. There are people who have comments that say this has happened, but there is no actual studies. And the study that was being proposed in the legislation also had on it, as one of the original co-sponsors, a Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, who is an outspoken supporter of amending Section 230. And so you did have people who are on there and a strong supporter of FOSTA SESTA. And she was one of the original co-sponsors of the Wyden bill that Carl was referencing. So again, it just goes to show that people who supported what Carl is saying support also supported FOSTA SESTA and also support amending Section 230. But FOSTA SESTA is a perfect example of legislation that was necessary because what it did is gave local and state law enforcement the legal tools and survivors the legal tools to go after websites that were knowingly facilitating human trafficking. And I know that most people on this call, I would hope, and people watching would support that type of legislation. And, and of course I do, but don't take my word for it. Uh, there are police on record saying that sesta Fossa has made their job harder. So we're hearing so, from law enforcement and from survivors saying sesta Fosta has hurt their ability to protect lives and stop criminals. Yeah. Because what they're saying is that because Backpage is no longer, in, so this is one of the points that drives me just batty and the survivors absolutely nuts, is when they say law enforcement makes it more difficult for law enforcement. The reason it makes it more difficult for law enforcement is because there's no longer live bait out there of young girls 
on these type of trafficking sites, so law enforcement can say, oh, there's a young girl that we know is on the open net. So I wouldn't want my daughter or my son or my niece or my nephew or my grandkids someday to be used as live bait so cops can make it easier for cops. We don't say that about illegal drugs. We don't say, oh, we should have illegal drug sales online because it makes it easier for cops to find drug dealers. So that is one of the most offensive arguments I hear is that we should use children as live bait to make it easier for cops. So I'm sorry, I had to just address that. No, no, no problem. So let's get Renee in, then we'll yeah. <laughs> I see, yeah, so um, after Renee's answer, we'll transition to Q&A. So please like add your comments, but yeah, let's hear it, Renee. Yeah, I think I'm also team nuanced, so kind of along Claude's lines there. Um, look, there's, there's no obligation uh, to deal with some of the more serious harms. So that's one of the things that somebody who's been, you know, first an activist and now in academia on this. Um, <clears throat> back in 2015, we were, you know, I personally was writing articles saying, hey, look, the recommendation engine is doing some really weird shit, and maybe somebody should be looking at that. And then lo and behold, for a 30-second news cycle about a week and a half ago now, we find out that Facebook's own internal research shows that 64% of the people who move into extremist groups do so through the Facebook recommendation engine. And that's the kind of stuff that academics don't have access to. You know, we've been fighting for data access for quite some time. We've, again, made some progress over the last two years, largely in response to the major public sentiment shift against the tech platforms. And this is one of these things where, you know, that, that is one, you know, activism, of course, is one form of, of driving reform. And economic incentives, of course, are a key part of that. But at the same time, there is no sustained obligation. So I think it's less about reforming 230 as such. That seems to be the law that everybody fixates on. It's, you know, uh, and I'm not a lawyer myself, but I think one of the key challenges is how do we think about regulatory bodies almost a little bit more, you know, the way we have them on Wall Street, where there's some self-regulatory, uh, there's some federal regulatory agencies, the exchanges have a certain degree of power and discretion. Uh, is there some sort of model like that uh, that allows us to have the oversight and to have the, the sort of stick, so to speak, um, to require sustained attention to these problems? Because right now the platform can decide tomorrow that this is no longer a thing that it's going to choose to pay attention to. Uh, and then we go back to where we were in 2014. Great. So um, if everyone doesn't have anything else to add to that, I think we could transition to questions that people have submitted. Uh, I'll start with the most recent one. How far, and I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on this, how far can reform legislation go in influencing platform moderation and editorial decisions without raising First Amendment issues? One of the, it, it's less about the First Amendment, it's more about free speech at the end of the day. Um, one of the things that I think Renee identified very early on in this discussion was the concept of working the refs, working the refs. And I think that's what you're seeing with a lot of Section 230 discussions is the notion of working the refs. You're seeing uh, people on the right raising the specter of removing Section 230. Uh, Josh Hawley did it today. You see people on the left raising the specter of amending Section 230. Uh, Speaker Pelosi did it just yesterday. Their underlying bases are ironically diametrically opposed because Speaker Pelosi wants more content removed uh, that she considers to be offensive and Senator Hawley wants less content to be removed. So you're seeing the same arguments for amendments of Section 230 for diametrically opposite reasons. And why is that? It's because they're trying to work the refs. They're trying to say to the platforms, if you don't do what I say you can do, because once again, the First Amendment says I can't pass a law dictating that you remove certain content or leave certain content up, then instead, I'm just going to threaten you really badly with something that you care a lot about. And we're going to hold Section 230 hostage unless you remove the content that I don't like, or in the case of Republicans, you keep up the content that I want to see remain. So that's really what a lot of this legislative uh, advocacy is really centered around. It's as Renee identified earlier on, it's working the refs. It's trying to force the platforms to make the decisions that are not necessarily best for their users or for their business model, but what's in the best interest of the politicians in power so that they can control ultimately what content can and cannot remain. Because while Amending Section 230 wouldn't necessarily directly conflict with the First Amendment. 
it does directly conflict with our American notions of free speech online. And that's really what I think all this is about. And I think the important points on curation um, is that it, it, in one sense, goes directly to the heart of what we're asking these platforms to do for us. So whether it be Facebook and our, uh, our friend feed, or if it's YouTube and what videos it surfaces, we go to these different services and we say, we want you to scour the internet and surface only the content I want. And I expect you to know what that content is with very little assistance from me. And I expect you to get it right most of the time. That is, by definition, curation. That is, by definition, a type of bias, a bias that plays toward my desires, my preferences, my wants. And so one of the difficulties that comes in, in writing legislation like this is that when we ask Google to scour the entire internet and we get annoyed if we have to look past the third return search result, and how often do we have to, right? Which tells you just how good they are, frankly, at that. That is them uh, doing content curation. It's the very core of the service they provide. And it's one of the reasons why they're insanely popular. The same thing's true with Facebook. I want you to minimize crazy Uncle Joe's political rants I don't want you to maximize pictures of my niece, right? And those are all decisions that are, are being made via algorithm, which gets into some of the recent proposals, even the proposal that appears to be coming out today from Senator Hawley and others. And then finally, the other point is, is that those decisions when they're made, particularly the autonomously made decisions, but even when they're made by individuals, they're not categor uh, categorized politically. They, they, don't, they don't tag them politically. Now, what that leaves us with is we say, well, to really understand if you're being a good Samaritan or if you're, if you're actually meeting the, um, the, the standards of Section 230, then we need to understand, is this disproportionately affecting conservatives versus liberals? Well, they don't, they don't tag the data that way. They, they, don't, they don't work that way. And I'm not even sure how you would do that. You know, and so the conversation we're having is just often so divorced from the actual mechanics of what this is. And it is a political conversation, which doesn't mean it's not relevant. It's very relevant. But when you try to bring that political conversation into the realm of the nuts and bolts of how all this happens, there's often a pretty big disconnect. So, uh, real quickly, just Quan, oh, some some information that I just uh, was pointed to yesterday to answer that question. There's a, a group that uh, kind of monitors all this and they put out, it's called Crowd Tangle, and they actually compiled the, the political analysis based on Facebook alone. Uh, it turns out that President Trump had 91% of total interactions uh, with respect to uh, presidential campaigns. 9% went to Biden. The top interactions for news agencies in the US, Fox News was number one. Number two was Breitbart. And uh, then you have ABC News and NPR, CNN, MB, ABC News and NPR. So the analysis is being done. Uh, the, this group uh, who published their report a couple weeks ago did the analysis and it turns out the bias if there is any actually falls in favor of republicans what i think ends up happening is the data doesn't match the narratives right so if my narrative and my purpose of fundraising is going to be tech hates conservatives and that data doesn't support it then i'll just adjust i'll just disregard the data so the good news Quan, i think we are starting to see a lot of research being done on these categories and trying to identify where the political lines begin to fall. Oh, no, I was going to say, uh, CrowdTangle is an analytics platform that Facebook owns. It's just the, uh, it's, a, it's a tool, we use it too. Um, we do see consistently, 
I think most of the conservative bias audits have turned up nothing, unfortunately, or, or fortunately. I mean, it really depends. <laughs> I, mean, it's good I don't mean, I want them to be biased. I mean that even <laughs> when those results turn up nothing, that doesn't satisfy the problem. And that's because somebody else raised the moderation stats with the number of takedowns and things that happen. And unfortunately, there are bad calls that are made with some regularity, actually. Uh, and so we're at a point now where everybody feels that their group is being uh, politically censored in some way, which is an interesting position to be in you know, as a researcher looking at this stuff. Um, I think part of that is also, though, what I was alluding to with working the refs, um, those very high profile instances, we've seen it from Marsha Blackburn, we've seen it from Elizabeth Warren, uh, where there are these accusations that application of policy is based on a content or political viewpoint, as opposed to a behavioral or, or you know, they used a word that they were not supposed to use or they were denied um, uh, running an ad, so paid speech is treated a little bit differently than organic content. The organic content stays up. Marcia Blackburn was allowed to tweet her video. Twitter would not accept money to run it as an ad. So there's a lot of nuance there, but when, when you have the president creating these, you know, <laughs> forms where you can go and put in your grievance and then he gets your email address at the end, you know, <laughs> the incentive is just, it's just not there. It, it's, it, it's, um, it lends itself towards perpetuating the notion of bias against individual people. And one of the things where I think tech falls down really is people don't understand that their feeds are curated. And if you periodically ask somebody on Twitter, why do you think you're shadow banned? I've had this conversation a number of times with people with you know, the big red X's in their bios. They'll say, my friends don't see 100% of the content I put out. And so there's just a fundamental lack of understanding that curatorial functions mean that not every tweet you write is like, the golden tweet that all of your friends are going to see. And I think that's where uh, tech has really dropped the ball on making these policies more transparent, putting that data out there. The crowd tangle research relationships are only six months old now, I think. So we're starting to see more of it, uh, but it's, it hasn't quite made its way into the narrative. And then the other thing I'll say is more information doesn't necessarily change the narrative. Uh, if people are hearing from people that they trust that uh, that, that Twitter is biased against the president and conservatives, or liberals for that matter, uh, that, that is going to be what they believe. Um, I, I do worry about some of the proposals that are out there that have First Amendment problems. I may agree with the goals of what they're trying to achieve, but that's what happened in the CDA context, which is you have the Exxon Amendment um, that was shot down on First Amendment grounds. And what I would hate to see is that some provisions that are not, that are coupled with some good provisions are now deemed unconstitutional under free speech. Um, Roger McNamee um, has a, mentioned a proposal on Bloomberg the other night, um, and basically was talking about if the algorithms are, you know, incentivizing the creation of, you know, hate speech and and and, and pushing hate speech out, then they should lose Section 230. I, I think those ideas are are are, are not good because it really gets into the free speech issue, um, and more importantly, the First Amendment issues. So I think as we look at these issues and we have to make sure that it's not about content. I always talk about, it's not about what people are saying, the political bias, getting back to my um, theatrical MPA a movie idea of, of ratings. It's, it's not about the content, it's the conduct. It's what are sites, what are platforms doing? What are they allowing to happen on their sites because of the way they built their platforms that are problematic? And I think if we stick, and that's what we did with FOSS Assess now, is we stuck with the conduct of the sites and not the content of the sites that they were knowingly facilitated in the project. So I think if you look at conduct versus content, you step away and, you, and we all need to make sure that we're not trampling on the First Amendment, which is not harmed whether or not we amend Section 230 unless you're using speech as a mechanism to actually change. So I think we are nearing the end of this, but I just wanted to give everyone a chance to put in their last 30 second word. I know we're not going to solve this today or tomorrow, but I think since everyone's trying to figure this out, as Kwan put it, um, I think giving people the takeaway would be very helpful. I think the fundamental challenge here is that um, the tech industry uh, looks at the public and says, we do not need to be regulated. You can trust us. And increasingly, the consumers and government are saying, well, we don't. And there are good reasons for that erosion of trust, and there are less than good reasons for some of that erosion. But one of the points I do want to make is that this is not purely 
and this conversation often moves toward this. This is not purely a conservative concern. Uh, and I think it's important for the, the industry itself to understand that. Um, earlier, I said it was a Gallup poll. I was wrong. It was a Pew poll. And I just, I just so 72% of those polled think that it is likely that, quote, social media platforms actively censor political views that those companies find objectionable, end quote. 85% of those on the political right believe that. But 62% of those on the political left share that same concern. And that means it's a bipartisan problem that's not going away. And that means that there's going to be political will for vastly different reasons on both sides of the aisle that has to be addressed. And until it is, we'll be having this conversation. When, when it comes to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, it is one of the best things that has been created for the internet in the past 20 some odd years. And it is disconcerting to me that we would consider risking all we have gained. Because at the end of the day, our conversations have basically talked about maybe three companies, right? Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. But there's so many more businesses and sites and services that rely on Section 230 that we just pay no mind to. It's kind of like appreciating oxygen. You don't realize it's there until it's gone. Services like Medium, reading user reviews on Yelp, uh, businesses able to sell stuff on Etsy and eBay. Section 230 is what makes all that possible. And before anyone even sits down and picks up a pen to write anything to amend Section 230, they need to really, really, really think about what are all the unintended consequences. And you can't rush through regulation because you have an emotional opinion. You need to actually do an analytical analysis and appreciate what you're doing. And that's hopefully what we're going to see going forward where legislators pick up the pen, they think about it for seven seconds or 10 minutes or two hours and realize it's not the right approach. Section 230 is what helps prevent the internet from being a cesspool. So I think 230 has had some positive benefits. Um, I also think it's time to take a look at it more closely. Um, one of the things that I think we, you know, Carl mentioned earlier about this is just threats by politicians who are trying to, you know, influence the rap. Um, I think it's, if that's Silicon Valley's view, I think, you know, what Han said is exactly right. They're missing it. This isn't some political play. This is deep thoughts. This is not something that has been lightly and politically motivated. These are people who have real concerns about the safety, security, and stability of the internet and want to make it safe and secure for all, and not just for those big companies, but also companies that are taking advantage of Section 230, like a Reddit. That's not a big Silicon Valley company. They were making 500 million, I mean, not Reddit, um, uh, Backpage. They were making $500 million a year. Um, on selling ads um, of, of young children. And so it's, it's about across the board. And these members have thought about it. I think the biggest and thing that bothers me when we talk about politics in Congress is, you know, Silicon Valley has this mindset, if you're only as smart as us, you realize how stupid you are. And I think members are, are tired of that. They know these issues. They have thought about these issues. They see the problem and now they're seeing it in a bipartisan way. And that's why Section 230 will be amended in a way that makes sense and helps create a better and safer internet and not the cesspool that parts of it are right now. Just say quickly, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, my, my, my belief in regulation being passed in any meaningful way is uh, low actually and has been for years now. Uh, I you know, we couldn't pass Honest Ads Act or any of the really basic niche tiny things that had bipartisan support. I'm waiting to see what uh, what a piece of 230 legislation would look like. Um, the lack of trusting is a very, very significant problem. I think this is partly because Silicon Valley, as I said before, hasn't really communicated to people how curation works, how algorithmic amplification mm -hmm. works, how a search engine works. Um, and that's, a, you know, particularly for older generations, um, that is a very serious lack of understanding that does allow for politically motivated actors because both sides fundraise on this at this point uh, to push a particular narrative which perpetuates that 60%, 70% uh, 
uh, ever increasing number, you know, we do have a crisis of trust. I think what we need to see is greater transparency from the platforms, better, more granular user controls. I mean, this is where Reddit's federated communities provide an interesting example. It's very hard to do that uh, on some of the other platforms, particularly Twitter, you know, it doesn't really lend itself to that dynamic. Um, but then just to close out on the national security front, you know, I think the problem is if there is no regulation, uh, if there is no obligation, then we're really at the mercy of the platforms to continue to respond to these things out of, uh, you know, out of, out of, out of goodwill and, and a concern about public sentiment. Uh, so I do think that there needs to be some form of regulatory measures in place that, that require that uh, handling, whether that's standard of care or mitigation of harms or one of the other approaches that's being broached. Uh, I think something needs to happen. Well, everyone, uh, thank you for coming. Like I said, not the end, not the big end or even the middle of this conversation. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, and please feel, feel free to follow up um, with everyone involved because this is really just getting started. Thanks. And thank you for having us and not and the people who are watching, not watching the competing Section 230 event um, on another <laughs> network. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks.